So was Northrop's YF-23 actually a better fighter than the F-22 Raptor? And if it was, why didn't it win a production contract? These days, you'll find lots of people online telling you that the YF-23 was the superior jet, and that Lockheed won the Advanced Tactical Fighter competition through more dirty politics than brilliant engineering. And while there is some truth to that, reality, as is so often the case, is a lot more nuanced than this narrative would make it seem. So let's talk about the YF-23, the YF-22, and the competition between these two aircraft. Because the truth is, the YF-22 wasn't just a really good choice, it very likely was the right one. All the way back in 1981, the U.S. Air Force kicked off its Advanced Tactical Fighter program aimed at fielding a new stealth air superiority fighter so capable it could even outclass America's already legendary fleet of F-15 Eagles. And they got pretty immediate buy-in from just about every major aerospace firm in the country, ultimately receiving at least 19 design proposals for this new stealth fighter. But by the end of the year, they had already whittled it down to really just two competitors, Northrop and Lockheed, both firms that were already building stealth aircraft for Uncle Sam. But because of the sheer scale of this effort and the need for a wider stealth industrial base, a couple of those losing firms teamed up with the two winners. Lockheed teamed up with Boeing, and Northrop teamed up with the F-15's own designer, McDonnell Douglas. And you might think that would be an advantage in this sort of competition, but it probably didn't shake out that way. Over the next decade, Lockheed and Northrop continued to refine their stealth fighter designs, culminating in a fly-off of sorts in late 1990, heading into early 1991, that saw Lockheed's YF-22 represent a fairly conventional approach to fighter design, with newly added stealth design elements incorporated throughout, and thrust vector control for improved aerobatic maneuverability, competing against Northrop's downright alien-looking YF-23, with its pronounced duck-bill chin, its diamond wings, and its all-moving V-tail that offered not just a smaller radar cross-section than Lockheed's entry, but better unrefueled range. Lockheed's YF-22, on the other hand, offered a higher top speed and a slight edge in maneuverability. But according to Paul Metz, the only test pilot to fly both of these aircraft, the YF-23's all-moving V-tail had such massive control surfaces that it nearly entirely compensated for the aircraft's lack of thrust vector control, falling only just short of the YF-22's maneuverability. And that sort of became the story of this whole competition, because these two aircraft were genuinely pretty evenly matched. Northrop would edge out Lockheed in some performance metrics, only to have Lockheed edge out Northrop in others, and usually neither did by all that much. Both aircraft had a top speed of Mach 2.2, both had a service ceiling of 65,000 feet, and while the YF-23 famously had a slightly smaller radar cross-section, the F-22 Raptor has a radar cross-section of 0.0001 square meters, meaning we're talking about the difference between a very tiny pebble and a slightly tinier pebble. The YF-23 did have slightly better unrefueled ferry range at 2,400 miles versus the YF-22's 2,000 miles. But the YF-22 performed more aggressive aerobatic maneuvers, hitting 7.9 Gs in testing versus the YF-23, which only hit 7.1. But it's important to note that that might have had more to do with salesmanship than actual capability, with Lockheed understanding the importance of demonstrating the aircraft's incredible aerobatic maneuverability to leave an impression on decision makers, versus Northrop, who had no interest in those sorts of theatrics and stuck to an all-business demonstration, which may have actually hurt them in the end. Both aircraft were designed to accommodate the same weapon systems, four AMRAMs, two Sidewinders, and an M61 Vulcan. And at the end of the day, the real truth is either of these aircraft would have been an excellent choice. They both had what it took to become the basis for an entirely new generation of fighters. They were so advanced and broadly capable by comparison to literally every other fighter on the planet that they were sure to become the basis by which all future fighter designs were compared. But the Air Force could only pick one. 
And with their performance so evenly matched across the scoreboard and literally tens of billions of dollars on the line, the Air Force had to look at this decision from every angle. And that includes a lot of stuff, good and bad, that happened far removed from the advanced tactical fighter competition. By December 31st of 1990, all the flying was done, and both firms submitted their final production proposals to the Air Force for consideration. And a bit more than four months later, on April 23rd of 1991, they announced their decision, awarding the contract to Lockheed to mature their YF-22 design into today's operational F-22 Raptor. But in order to understand how external factors took what was a very close race, and made it something of a sure thing for Lockheed, we need to think about what was going on in the country and around the world in the years leading up to 1991. And especially in those four months the U.S. Air Force spent making their decision. You see, by 1991, Northrop was on the tail end of some two straight decades of scandals and controversies, starting in the 1970s, when they were very publicly accused of making illegal campaign contributions to the Nixon presidential campaign, to doling out some $30 million in bribes to foreign government officials to help advance sales of the F-5. And then in the 1980s, Northrop employees were indicted on charges of falsifying test results and providing faulty equipment to the Air Force's MX nuclear cruise missile program. And in 1990, Northrop itself pled guilty to some 34 separate fraud charges, resulting in more than $17 million in fines. And while Northrop and Lockheed both had stealth aircraft already in the works for the U.S. military, by 1991, the B-2 bomber program was so far behind schedule and over budget that it was facing potential cancellation. And to make matters even worse for Northrop, their partner, McDonnell Douglas, wasn't doing any better. They had secured a contract eight years earlier in 1983 to develop the Navy's first stealth fighter in the A-12 Avenger II. But by January of 1991, it was so far behind schedule, so overweight, and so over budget that it became a scandal unto itself, facing cancellation at just about the same time the Air Force started considering which firm to pick to build their new stealth fighter. And conversely, 1991 looked very different for Lockheed. You see, not only did Lockheed already have a pretty well-established track record when it came to cutting-edge aviation programs, with platforms like the U-2 spy plane and SR-71 Blackbird already under their belt, but in January of 1991, another historical event took place that also shined a pretty positive light on Lockheed and their stealth aircraft designs. That event, of course, was Operation Desert Storm. The U.S. deployed just 36 F-117s to Desert Storm, making up only about 2.5% of the combat aircraft in theater. But over that two-and-a-half-week air campaign, those F-117s engaged some 40% of the targets inside Iraq, flying 1,300 combat sorties to take out 1,600 separate targets without a single aircraft lost. Lockheed's stealth jets operated with such impunity over Iraq that Senator Sam Nunn, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, called it the heart of our offensive power. And General Buster Glossom called the F-117 the backbone of America's strategic air campaign. And what all this means is that from January to April of 1991, the Air Force was left to consider. Northrop's YF-23 design proposal that came with their multiple decade-spanning run of scandals and controversies and their recent budgetary mismanagement of a stealth aircraft versus Lockheed's YF-22 proposal and their very recent demonstration of extreme stealth combat prowess in Desert Storm. And while the branch has not officially said that any of this played a role in their decision, they did say that they chose Lockheed because they had more confidence in Lockheed's ability to produce the aircraft they needed and the numbers the program called for. At the end of the day, the YF-23 was a genuinely incredible aircraft, and maybe one of the few fighter designs in history that can stand and swing with the Raptor. But the YF-22 just seemed like the safer bet, and it's worth remembering that that YF-22 design ultimately matured into what is now the most dominant air superiority fighter on the planet. It certainly wasn't a bad call. So, was the YF-23 the better fighter? 
We may never know, because we never got to see an operational F-23 manifest, but the race between prototypes was so tight, it may really come down to your personal preference. But awarding a multi-billion dollar fighter production contract is about more than just comparing specs on a stat sheet. It's also about political buy-in, public support, program management, and a bunch of other stuff that's just not as sexy to talk about, but just as important when it comes to a program actually coming to fruition. And before I sign off, I just want to let you guys know that I posted a poll over in our community tab to see how many of you nerds out there are active or reserve military, veterans, or civilians, just because I'd be really interested to find out. So if you have a minute, I'd love to hear from you.